what? We're live. Hey, guess what? It's just the Sky Kid. It's Thursday night. I have a night of the round table. As always, Kiff points. And we're at the BNB. &B. And on the phone with us this evening is Chris Poland from the Warsaw Poland Bros and California Celts. Hello and welcome. Hello and thank you for having me. So we have two bands to discuss. Um, you are founder originator of Warsaw Poland Brothers and um, a band that is new to me because uh, when Destiny booked you I had not heard yet of your other band the California Celts so tell the viewers um, we can do a split I guess when did Warsaw Poland Brothers start and then how long have California Celts been going around the short answer is Warsaw Poland Bros started in Flagstaff, Arizona in 1991, roughly, maybe earlier, but safe to say 91. And then um, we, that band has been consistently playing for years. And then California Celts are about, I've always been roughly about 17 years, I think. Wow. Maybe less. Maybe less. Maybe, maybe, let's just say 16. <laughs> and um, what happened is when I stopped touring with my brother every day, coast to coast, which we did for, for just shy of 20 years straight, I um, decided, well, I took some time off to have some kids, and then my wife said I was bugging, and then I needed to go out and get that energy out on the weekends and perform. So naturally I obliged being an eager musician and uh, I went out there and immediately knew how to get paid at an Irish pub. So I already knew some Irish songs. So I just went in there and sold them the Irish hat. And I had a kind of a mentor, if you'd call him that, an Irishman teach me the ropes on how, what to do and what to expect and what songs would be requested. So I went in there and I would like to say I figured it out and pulled down a steady paycheck for shoot, 16 years maybe. And uh, every weekend, sometimes twice, three times a week, to a uh, five hour radius from Las Vegas to San Diego, central coast of California to um, Tucson, Arizona. Wow. So <laughs> that's, that's what's going on. That is a very long history of playing out. So I think what um, I'm most interested in is how did you make being a touring musician your life? How was it profitable enough for you to be able to do that? Like, what are the tricks of the trade? How could, how'd you do it? Okay, good question. You have to do, you can't... <sighs> No one's going to look after one's career better than oneself. So I, when I was 20, up to the age 25, I thought I was going to get by on my part of me, my looks, my talent, and my song craft. I thought I would get, like in an old-fashioned movie, I thought I would get swooped up, recognized, and put in the limelight. But by 25, I kind of sobered up. <laughs> <laughs> quite metaphorically and literally and I that's when I created the Invisible Mass Records and I, I realized I have to do it myself everything myself from the photographs to the video to to creating the songs to all the stuff I already did plus more now I have to do the apparel line which I, you know I'd like to mention <laughs> I still have the apparel going stronger than ever and I'm that's how currently I'm making a living from the apparel and that's a like at least a third of the profit is apparel. It's so important for young musicians. You get a good good shirt, don't skimp. Get a good design, make it in all all sizes and call the line. Each each logo has it its own line and start making a third extra profit with your guarantees. But what's sad, dun 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 is that it's forever changed. The small guys can never well for the next two, three years Small bands won't be able to play in small venues indoors, and that's how I made my living for the last 30 years. Yeah. <sighs> so I, 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 and it's crazy, it's coinciding with my career. Like, I'm actually in a very lucky spot. I feel bad for people 
who were, you know, half, half my age is up and coming or just a few years younger than me. But what, I mean, what about those residents? It's true. I lost residencies. I was booked months ahead, but there's people I'm already established kind of, right. but there's kids that are struggling and literally <laughs> sad. Do you think that, um, it, to coincide with the times, you know, is it now more than ever the best time to, to make sure that you have good merch that you're trying to run and make profit off of? And should people be trying to support those up and coming artists by focusing on purchasing albums that they already have and continuing to share what's already established and buy that merchandise? Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, I, I always think it's me when I see people out there on, I'll say, it, face group, Facebook groups, and I see them, oh, I got a shipment of vinyl today. I'm like, wow, it's, it's still alive, that thing that I loved when I was younger, and um, collecting records and touching them. <laughs> yeah, know? that's what we heard from, I would say, everybody we've talked to so far, this past month has said vinyl is the thing the sound the touch the look the taking it out the sleeve you know i feel yeah. like, i feel like that is become um an important piece of merchandise that uh is still kind of expensive but is making its way back as one of those namesake items yeah it's just it's not cost effective for the artist though because I can get thousand discs, thousand vinyl LPs for the same price I could get eight thousand CDs. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden now my numbers are going down, and I'm not getting rid of CDs like I used to in the old days. I'm not putting CDs out at all, mm. and put vinyl out again, but at smaller numbers. So it's a new era for me. I, I, you know, this is my 16th release in 30 years, and uh, it was my first. I'm referring to Hillbilly Ska from the California Celts. Yeah. The first first LP on vinyl, and there's only a thousand, and there's well, actually, there's only 900 now, you know. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, show, I love show business, and the, I love song records. I love completing the uh, sales cycle of a record, creating a song for free, something for nothing in my mind and creative, you know, information and put it on, you know, make an arrangement, orchestrate it, put it on an album, stream it, release it, maybe make CD, maybe make vinyl, sell it, and then recoup the money and completing that sales cycle and getting, rid of getting the product down to less than 100. It's a satisfying feeling. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so, you know, with you having this you know, long running history with music and how music has changed and, you know, booking and all that sort of thing. Can you talk to us about, you know, when you were first starting off and you were trying to get yourself established and, um, you know, bouncing around from coast to coast, what, what was it like? Because were you just calling venues blindly and trying to book? <laughs> book? Uh, what? Yes. Here's how, here, here's, I'll tell it concisely and quickly as possible. Well, we got time. It doesn't have to be as quick. <laughs> <laughs> I would sit at my desk in Tucson, Arizona, and um, I would roll splits of low-grade Mexican weed. <laughs> <laughs> Smoke them in succession. But as I was doing so, I made probably a hundred, and I'm not exaggerating, 100 phone calls a day for at least 10 years, maybe 15 years straight. And to coincide with that, I um, was sending out 15 packages, press kits, I guess they, they call them, they call them e e electronic press kits now, but you know, sending out 15 press kits a week for about 12 years easily, maybe longer. And so, oh, and then postage, we were selling, sending mailers. The postage alone was $700 Damn. every six weeks. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. It was a little postcard with all of our dates on it, but 
that's what was happening. That it was so difficult before the internet, and it was all about making calls. Now nowadays, I book a whole tour on Facebook Messenger, and I just uh, I make I, I don't you know I break I more than break even. We make a little bit of profit, but it's just funny. Like within ten minutes, I could book a Colorado tour every day on, just by hey you know what, what do you think you know hitting up buddies from twenty years back. Yeah. Finally in that position, you know, instead of begging. <laughs> so as you were calling venues and setting things up, how were you then, because it wasn't just calling venues, you also then had to become friends and in the know of all the scenes all over the place so you could contact bands too, right? Yeah, so look, we, we learned early on in the game that ska bands were cooperative and then rock bands were not. So we already played, but you know, probably a third ska music at that point, starting out. So we, it was logical to me because I was getting the zines at the time, the little mag homemade magazines that were mailed around the world from different. I probably had 15 different zine subscriptions just to keep my thumb on the pulse of the ska scene internationally, and. Uh, so that's, this is all pre-computer business, you know, pre-internet.com. <laughs> so with that, you know, t logistic-wise, as you're setting up shows, how easy or difficult was it to get all of those same people on board to go travel all over the place? Great question. I want to first, oh gosh, you'll have to remind me of it. We would have to uh, stop the trucks truck stops before the cell phone era and we'd sit down and order our food at a table with the telephone attached with a cord and with our calendar right there eating our eggs or you know whatever steak and eggs or whatever we were eating at the time and booking shows and calling our voicemail back in Tucson to get our messages trying to conduct booking and touring at the same time that is stressful especially hungover every day and Sleep deprived. <laughs> right. And then, okay, back, back to your question, because I have an answer. Remind me, please. It was how, like, logistic-wise was it easy or difficult uh, to get yeah. everybody on board to do these tours? Okay. Here's the honest answer, and I don't think many people would be as upfront about it, but musicians are left, players are left, and best left in the dark as to... The less you tell them, less information, the smoother the ship will sail. <laughs> this is coming from the captain. Yeah. Yeah. So I hate to say it. And so musicians, at least the ones that worked for me for the last 25 years, they don't even ask questions. They get in the van. I tell, <laughs> they, all they want to know is how much they're getting paid. Okay. And then I tell them how much they're getting paid. They get in the van and say, what's up? Where are we going today? And I tell them. <laughs> Good. It's a different kind of uh, profession. It is definitely. So So tell us, how did you come to choose this profession? How did you form Warsaw and California Celts? And, you know, what leads you here today? Still doing it. I always, I always wanted to be a musician. Well, probably about age 10, when John Lennon got assassinated, he became alive to me. Then I realized, then I gained the connection of... Uh, he died, but yet he came alive to me, and so I was like, oh my gosh, eternal life through music. So I was kind of saved by music in that aspect. I wanted to live on through my music, and um, so my wee footprint here on planet Earth for my short time. So then I got in public school, and then one day I realized, um, all the way from playing trumpet and band, all the way through high school, one day about freshman year of high school, or sophomore year, it hit me and someone, I was asking around and I thought everybody was in band was going to be a musician for the rest of their lives. And I remember depression set in when I was thinking to myself, all these people, they're, they're not going to do music? What are they doing? Why are they wasting my time? You know, I it just, from this 10 years old on, I just knew I was going to play music. Then I didn't know I was going to play rock and roll until I got to Flystaff and I went to university and I met a character named Danny Madsen, and he just dropped out of the army because he's having acid parties, doing acid in tanks <laughs> during operations, and smoking weed on base, and having big parties, beer. Anyways, 
after he got kicked out of the army, he toured with the dead. And then he finally came back to Flagstaff because his brother, Tim Matson was in a great band going to university with me. So the Matson brothers are miracles of humanity. And so Danny Matson, the freak <laughs> of nature, he's like, you're in university, what do you play that? I'm like, oh, bass violin. And he says, man, you gotta play a rock and roll instrument. I'm like, oh, I do, I play drums and bass. I like a funk or whatever, reggae and funk, punk rock. And then he's like, so we started a band, but he, he's basically saying, forget about the orchestra, you're not gonna get paid. Ah. You're, he's, tell, he's teaching, and here's a, he's a drug, he's a loady, a lovable loady, Till, till he dies, I love him, you know. <laughs> but here's this here's this guy, <laughs> cheats to the wind, t- telling me, you know, older guy that I looked up to, saying he sold me the rock and roll dream. He's like, dude, you don't have to sign government forms. You just go in, you get the money, you get the girls, you go. I'm like, oh, really? Is that is that He's like, yeah, bro. He's from the old school, you know. And then that's the thing. Thing my brother Aaron said, you know, we can't be that way anymore. And <laughs> We were the big, we were the end of an era, and for better for worse, we witnessed it and we got away with it. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you got a bunch of stories to tell, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, we're we're gonna be we're gonna be. Uh, well, no one's gonna. That's a sad thing. I, to a point, one time, I realized I had another another realization about age 38 or whatever. I was at a party somewhere several times, and the same thing would happen to me. I would, I'd hear, I'd just try to have fun with people and they're telling a story. And I'm like, oh, you know, try to relate as humans do. Only my story <laughs> is three times better in a better landscape or whatever. I was like out doing it, but I really wasn't exaggerating. I just, you know, happened to have a tour life. And so I just, and then after a while, it didn't reflect well on me. It was like, okay, I was no more fun to party with when people, either people thought I was lying or like, okay, rich guy or whatever whoever you think you are so it was that epiphany so like the party didn't stop being fun to me <laughs> as i approached the age of 40 and then you know progressions of life happen mm. so when did it, you know you said that you toured and then you took some time off and you built a family um but you've always still played music so where in sequence did kids come and how easy or difficult was it to have a family support your musical endeavors? Well, it's not easy to compromise. And the difficult part is when you're getting in on Sunday, sun up on Sunday and everyone's waking up and you're expected to, you know, hold a baby or make breakfast and you haven't slept and you've been drinking all night. (laughs) (laughs) It's not easy, but, you, you know, it's, something you bit off, you have to, I'm really good at finishing things. That's why I have a lot of my contemporaries and buddies, they have great ideas, some of them better than me. But what they're not able to do is articulate their ideas onto a medium, whereas I am able to do that, fortunately, because I don't know what it is, but I'm able to complete what I started. Good. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that. That is a skill. And as your kids have gotten older, have they been incorporated into your music? Yeah, the the last they're on two releases. They're on um total the California Celts record or C D um called Totally Nautical Pirate Songs of the Spanish Main. They even wrote a song called The We Young Maidens and they're singing and they wrote the second verse. Aww. And a bit, a bit of the third verse, <laughs> and yeah, that's a hundred percent original song. That one, and uh, they're singing on others, and then I know they're singing on the new California Cal- vinyl, Hillbilly Ska. They're singing all over that one. I think two or three songs. So, yeah, go ahead. Oh no, go, do you want to finish that first? Yeah, they they have their own songs, and we're working on the oldest one, Charlotte. We're working on her album. And we're, you know, one song in. And, uh, but yeah, she has a diff- totally different style than me. I'm, I have more crisp tones, jangly mod 60s tones. She has more muted 70s tones. She helped me cut all the highs off at the piano, cut all the highs off the guitar. I'm like, 
and flood the river, like, you know, some interesting new school stuff. So I trust her and it um, can't be the same thing I'm doing exactly. So I'm glad to do something different with her. Is it kind of neat that you get to see a rebirth and a different interpretation of your love through your kids? Well, sure, because especially, I've got an example, because the song Love is Stronger Than Pride, probably one of my better songs. Um, it's a peppy little ska number when I sing it, and when she does it, it becomes this, I say, emo, but she calls it indie, guitar, <laughs> sad group. So, and she takes his song, and you, it's almost unrecognizable. It's the same song, but the way she interprets my song, and then she said is another song that she interprets very well. So, yeah, she's going to give my songs, hopefully, a rebirth once we promote her record, complete it, and promote it. Is and it what I'm very proud, because she's choosing my songs, because she understands that there's no copyright issues. Right. <laughs> Smart girl. So, and I'm honored, because she, she, likes, she, she likes them. Because you, you too, okay, so I, th we're going to back up a little bit. So how did you get the name Warsaw Poland Brothers? All right, I'll try, try to tell this lame story as fast as possible. <clears throat> I put out a cassette tape when I moved. When I was 18, I moved from Yucca Valley, California, in the center of the high desert, in the Mojave Desert, to go to the University of Flagstaff in the largest stand of Ponderosa Pines in North America and the largest population of Native Americans on Earth. So like quite a culture shock from my California surfer, Bodhi, desert, rat, uh, you know, motors off-road, motorcycle, dozer boy, gun shooting, toting. So here I am now with, you know, music students and Native Americans, different culture, and got my mind changed with reggae. Oh, I'm straight too far. What was the question? <laughs> How did you come up with the name Warsaw? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, so I put together a cassette when I transitioned to university. It's like, you know, that's what we did in the 80s. We put a cassette together, a mixtape of my original music with drum machines, guitars, and synthesizers, and basses, and me singing out of tune, like a, a dead Englishman sound, my mother would say, gothic Englishman. And so I put this cassette tape out, and I called, for lack of better names, I put Poland on it, my last name. So when I was at university, and I started meeting cats, Nanny Matson, the guy I was telling you about earlier, who uh, sold me on rock and roll lifestyle, he said, we can't have the name of the band Poland after you. I'm like, why not? <laughs> it's my song. He's like, it's all of our songs. We're democracy. I'm like, all right. <laughs> and uh, so I'm like, well, what, what are you going to name it, guys? And then right away, Warsaw Pact came up. And then I'm just like, so I settled on Warsaw, which not the greatest name in the world because we have a lot of fans that are hardcore fans. And a lot of my name being Chris Poland as well. I'm the dude from Megadeth. Very talented guitarist. <laughs> That's uh, funny because a few people throughout this feed have been like, you're interviewing a guy from Megadeth? Oh, wait, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a trip. And, and my whole life, I get it. I go to Guitar Center, give him my telephone number, and the young rocker dude look up at me and goes, are you, and I'll, I'll say, yeah. Like, what are you doing nowadays? I said, yeah, I gave up metal. Just play some ska music, some reggae, <laughs> jazz from time to time. <laughs> They're like, no, can't contain their disappointment. <laughs> mm. Oh, boy. But yeah, nothing's original. Even my heroes, the English beat, they, all their songs, not all their songs, their, their greatest original, excuse me, I'll slow down. Their first most popular songs were covers from Jamaica in the 60s. I was unaware of that as a child, listening to them. And even their name, The Beat, was already taken here in America. It's like, The Beat, The Beat, The Then I realized in 1996 that themes and ideas can't be copywritten. So, copyrighted, I don't know if I use that word right. So, okay, let me go back to my, I'm, I'm sidetracking. Let me go back to my name. So, over the years... We were as Warsaw. I went, worked at the music store, Dad Nabbits in Flagstaff. What a life. I got to work at a music store. And uh, 
so one of the know it all hipsters come Eric comes up and says, Hey, you know Warsaw's already a band. I'm like, What? Oh. Yeah. And it was, you know, Joy Division, pre Joy Division, they only had five hundred cassette tapes put out by a Dutch label in nineteen like ninety one. And I no like even earlier, in like eighty six or something. Even earlier, it was never really a band until later that got packaged in the late 90s. They started packaging Joy Division, got popular, so they started packaging Warsaw. So I start, that's when I started adding Poland Bros. There comes my name again that I wanted in the first place. But I have a stereotypical person that comes up about once a month at our shows. And their pants are just a little, their jeans are a little different, their shirt's tucked in, they're muscular, and they march right up, and they're light in complexion, and they're stout, and they just wait right at the front of the stage. And I, I can spot it every time now, I'm good at it. But what they want to know is why are you called Lhasa? <laughs> so I'm like, I've already memorized from years ago, I just go, Shintoble, Shintoblat. <laughs> I just I just like say a bunch of Polish words. I can't even make a sentence. I just and they are so relieved. They're like, they, they, they start asking, but why? Why is your name that? I'm just like, it's my last name. It's my name. That's so. <laughs> all. That's my name. Don't wear it out, bro. Uh -huh. <laughs> See, that works perfectly then. So then, how about California Celts? Where did so, that come with from? With that lesson. With that lesson learned of picking uh, a band name that didn't quite fit the band, um, I thought good and hard. I'm like, well, what is a name that could... <laughs> What's the question someone always asks when they're booking? When I'm booking about, well, where are they from? Uh, they're from Tucson. What kind of music do they play? Uh, reggae. All right. Those are the two questions I've always got asked. So it's only a natural conclusion that you pick a name that tells what kind of music you play and where you're from. Okay. California. Celts. And when I thought of it, I Googled it and nobody else came up. I'm like, holy crap. Did I just think of a great idea? <laughs> so I uh, jumped on it and I was already trying to make a living or making a living playing in pubs every weekend in Irish pubs and Los Angeles and Inland Empire and Orange County and the High Desert and the Low Desert and Temecula Valley. So where are a lot, so how many, okay, Warsaw Poland Brothers has how many members and how, oh God. yeah, <laughs> and, and Kelly, how many? so, so like, you, if you, I, I, okay, how many currently does Warsaw have? Um, I can't answer that, but we've had over 100 members Damn. cycle in and out of my groups, two groups. Wow. And there's actually four groups that consistently play. There, there's the California Crowds. Yes, I saw that too. the seasonal, they're seasonal. But there's a lot of players that, because there's eight, eight to ten pit players on stage every night with that group. So there's a lot of different players that cycle in and out. But what is more important, and I'd like to recognize, is the players that passed. That's 15 dead bandmates. Wow. I need to commit all of their names to memory and just be able to read them off. But sadly enough, one or two of them, I never knew. One of them I didn't know. His first or last, I forgot his first and last name because he was one gig again. Another one, I only remember his first name. And uh, a couple of them are female, and a couple of them I knew really well, and I still think about all the time, like four or five of them out of 15. And then I, I keep finding out about them, you know. I can't believe it, but it happens. I can't believe that I keep going on. So it's it's up to me to just keep on putting out music. It's like a gift at this point. It's a game. i got to play the game, stay healthy, put out records, and get my little footprint of artistic endeavor out here in the atmosphere. So that's amazing that you've had such turnover and have continued on. Because, so, you know, sometimes we meet bands, we talk to them, 
they're mm -hmm. a few rotations in, and then we find out that they're no longer a band just because that it just took too, you know, it was too much. So how? And let me just tell you, that's <laughs> the silliest thing ever, and it's the weakest excuse. And I laugh, I always laugh. You have to take. It's not a democracy. A good band is a dictatorship. Yeah. And it's sad. But I don't true care how much acid you do in a tank. It's a not a democracy. <laughs> it's not. I tried it both ways. I started off as a democracy, and when what when I just took the bull by the horns and said, hey, it's my name, my direction, I'm writing the songs, I'm booking the shows, I'm buying the insurance, I'm paying the payment on the van. Wow, yeah. It's my, I'm paying for the t-shirts, it's my business. I mean, once I realized that, it was another realization that I had. Once you realize that, everything becomes, your career starts moving faster once you realize that only you will help out you. So how did you manage all of that turnover do you you know have a consistent well group? california counts i figured out a strategy the first strategy was learn everything myself well so i could play all the instruments i could front i, I have front of the band on every instrument singing on drums you name it i've done it all played saxophone singing but what i've learned to do which is what is lately that is more mature in the last five years i've overstocked California Celts. So instead of having four or five players on stage, I'll have six and seven. It will sound fantastic, but my my goal in doing this is if anybody doesn't show up, I can have the part covered. That's wonderful. So mm -hmm. and on the show must go on. If someone's fighting with someone's girlfriend, someone's girlfriend got jealous. I hate to say, it. girl, someone's boyfriend got jealous. <laughs> oh dear. That shouldn't break a band up. You need to play the gig and get a replacement. If if the band's got a good opportunity, but Joey, the drummer, is out of town that weekend with his girlfriend or wife, or he, too bad. The show must go on. Hot, too bad. Hire a drummer that's better than Joey. Play the show and get your dues. It's a band. It's more than one person. So besides. So, so really having the mindset, if you're going to make it and you're going to put the blood, sweat, tears, write the music, it, it should be viewed as a business, as a commodity. And, you know, I'm, I'm in the same boat as you when we've had people cancel on us for things like, you know, or not all of us can do it or we don't know how to do this. I'm actually been impressed. So we do this show out of our basement in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And we've had a few bands actually find session musicians so that they could come because their mindset has been very much the same, that the, the show has to go on. So yeah. anybody out there who's watching, listening in a band, as Chris can confirm, if this is going to be your business and this is going to be your life, that show goes on. Don't let little things stop you. Yeah. Um, but... Oh... As well as doing your, you know, actual musicianship, you run Invisible Mass Records as well, yes? Yeah, it's just, a, it, I don't really run it. Well, yeah, I guess I do, because I, I shipped out three packages today, of vinyl and some shirts, a polo. <laughs> so, yeah, I do. So how did that come to be? Where along the, the line? Whole, <laughs> for, ni 1995, when I woke, woke up and I realized... I woke up really hungover and dried out from some bad drugs. And uh, I realized that nobody's going to come and swoop me up for my own talent's sake, that, that I needed to do this on my own. So I got serious and started making 100 calls a day. I, I came up with the moniker Invisible Mass Records because I wanted to put out all of the albums of different bands, but it's all us, like a Motown concept. Well, we're playing, you know, the California Celts is us, it's, you know, Warsaw is us, Mod Professor is us. California crowd it's a different moniker different photograph but it's all the same musicians under one record label invisible mass Ooh. so how, how, yeah. how do you start that like where like if somebody is is here listening tonight like I just need that extra step that push like how do you jump into making either that side of the business an actual business you know, like, how, do, how does that work? How do you eventually set up and go, oh, we now have a record label? 
But I, nowadays, it's even easier. Nowadays, I mean, I, I don't even have a website. <laughs> it's just Facebook. And I put my logo on Facebook. If it gets taken down one day, I'll find another place to put my logo up. And then I, it, it's simple. I just do mail orders and you pay for ads and social media and you ship out you ship out product to people, mail order through private messenger and Venmo and PayPal. And um, here's the most important thing. Whoever owns, I'll call it CD Baby, mine is CD Baby, there's Bandcamp, there's other sites. Whoever sets up the account basically owns it and makes the money. They put their credit card on it. They're paying for it, they're getting paid. Only one person gets to get paid. So if you're the one person writing the songs and, and paying for the records to come out, you're that person that signs up for CD Baby or Bandcamp or whatever service that's going to distribute your music and stream it worldwide to all the services, major and minor. So the most important thing is to sign up with a service like that and... Uh, watch you know watch your numbers and promote then you have to promote and once you have the service your albums are in the system once your album's in the system you can access them on spotify youtube and then you promote them on social media and if you have to pay for it great if it's organic even better have all your friends i don't have the benefit because i'm not in that age category where i go out and party every night and I could turn the whole scene on my music and have everyone, my whole clique like it. I'm not there anymore. I have to pay for it and pick people in England with like-minded, you know, ska tendencies or Celtic tendencies or and pick my market when I want to pay for it here and there. And you don't pay a lot. I don't pay a lot. I mean, you can. The more you pay, the faster your business grows. I try to keep it on the organic side, mail order here and there, and have it distributed there and there. <laughs> so you, I mean, the... the... The resounding theme has been do it yourself, do it yourself, do it yourself. And Chris, you you seem to do a lot of things by yourself. So are you mixing, mastering, recording, or do you partner with people that you know who, who do that and you go to a studio? Or, you know, are you making your own merch? Do you draw up all of the imagery? Like where, or do you have partnerships? Yeah, um, my biggest partnerships my longest partnership is with my brother, and I'm trying to rekindle it, but he's not responsive. I love him so. And uh, I get a lot of energy working with him, and he taught me how to uh, record, engineer, mix. And so he, I've only, of the 16 releases that we've been this whole mass have done, I've only released two, one, two, or three, I believe, that are me, the last three albums. Um, I'll be specific, Oktoberfest by the California Krauts, Hillbilly Ska, the current LP by the California Celts, and the other one by the California Celts called Totally Nautical Pirate Songs of the Spanish Main, which they, I finally, they, I have some good mixes on there. Even, even my brother said, okay, you know how to mix. My little brother gave me the pat on the back, and I'm finally there after you know all those years sitting by his side telling him what I want to hear and he was getting those sounds from me as my engineer. And that was a process. I was playing producer, he's playing engineer. Now I'm my own engineer. It's less inspirational, not having someone in the room with you. So I bounce a lot, here's the segue, I bounce a lot, a little bit from Kevin Patterson, the drummer, family friend, second generation, his father and my father made music together. So Kevin is the drummer and he's really steady. He doesn't feel and he just plays the beat all the way through, and then I do the fills over on top. So our, it's so easy to click everything together. And uh, Kevin also, here's a mir miracle, he is a master screen printer for, for decades. And he's only 40 years old, and he could screen print with white, thick viscosity, and get three passes, and keep the detail, and keep that thick white ink on a black shirt for, shoot, you can wash it over and over for eight years, and it'll still look good. Wow. So I'm very lucky. I have Kevin Patterson and second-generation family friend, 
and his father and my father had a business, so he and I also have a business. We didn't plan it that way. It's, it's how small town things happen. And he's my drummer of the California Celts in Warsaw. He knows all the book of Cal- the California Krauts, the Mod Professor. And the Mod Professor is our cover band of New Wave and Surf songs. <laughs> and I don't promote it because it's not original. But it's fun and funny at the same time. <laughs> Do you... So, so why... Why ska? What turned you on to uh, ska? Okay, okay. It starts because I'm not fond of rock and roll, and as a kid, distortion scared me, literally. When I heard Sabbath growing up in this rocker town here, it would scare me, frighten me. The kids were always playing it too loud, and the distortion just rattled me, and I thought it was obnoxious. Until later in life, I was able to hear distortion at a low volume and appreciate it through punk rock, <laughs> and later, later through some other rock. And... Uh, so I attended, and then being a bass player and being 12 years old in 1982, I realized music, there was a dichotomy in music. I realized that there was rocker music and new wave music. And the one common thread that new wave had music, the one common thread of both music is the bass guitar. There could be new, new wave music without bass guitar, excuse me, new wave music without guitar, but the bass guitar is still there. Mm-hmm. So I noticed that early on, no matter what style of music, bass guitar is going to be there. So I gravitated to play the bass guitar, and I liked things that weren't rock. So I, I studied, as a youngster, I studied funk until I figured out the Chili Peppers in 86. I'm like, oh, yeah, and then uh, Parliament when I was youth, and later um, James Brown. But then I, I was also into gothic English music, you know, dark wave. They call it nowadays dark wave, but back then we just called it goth. And I was into it. And uh, so I went to university and I wanted to play a band, but I didn't want to play Americana, butt rock, 70s, you know, Delta, Taker blues, you know. I didn't want to do that, so I wanted to do anything but that. So I started Warsaw with a gothic image, and we played one-fourth gothic, one-fourth funk, all the chili peppers, one-fourth ska, and one-fourth we would take covers and make them reggae like we do god save the queen but make it ska huh so we noticed in the flagstaff market which we played every weekend we noticed that the crowd would say more ska and they would dance to the ska numbers and they'd cross their hands on the gothic dark wave industrial (laughs) songs (laughs) and they maybe one or two people would be that bouncing around during the funk and reggae maybe a couple of hippies here and there. So right away I noticed, I was, like Jimmy Cliff or someone said, give the people what they want. So what they really wanted was the ska. And this was happening in 1993, 94 in Blackstaff, Arizona, and it was shaping me. So naturally, it was like back, meanwhile, back in the laboratory, me and Danny Madsen, who I keep <laughs> mentioning, the drummer, we're in the laboratory and we're making more ska songs. We are literally doing that. How are we going to do it? Let's make more ska. They want ska. More ska. So our, shoot, our second record's called War Ska because they were saying War Ska, More Ska, War Ska. They were chanting that. So we made a record. <laughs> so what was the scene like then, and how does it compare to now? Well, back then, I was in the Arizona scene, and the, when I got to school, there was kegs on campus, Stroh's, Stroh's were giving away beer because there was 18 year olds that were grandfathered in to the law that had just passed like a year before I got there. So basically there was on campus drinking and, you know, drugs. My exposure to like an animal house, a party, as great as years of my life, you know? And, uh, oh, sidetrack. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 uh. That's your question. I'm sorry. <laughs> the scene. What was it like then compared to now? Oh, because the bars closed at one, they closed early. Wow. The scene was every Arizona city that we performed at, it was already a known thing that there would be an after party, an after bar, as they say in Minnesota. <laughs> and so <laughs> we'd, go, we'd have, it was more, the show, was, it was less about the show 
and more about planning for the after party. And so I didn't take the show. We didn't take the show. No one took the show seriously. They were drunk, getting in fights, being rude, just having fun, bouncing around playing the ska, punk rock and ska and reggae, funk. And um, we just couldn't wait to get to the after hours party to flirt with the girls. That's the facts. And because that culture existed, is the fact that Arizona closed at one. So when we started touring other places, particularly California, you think, oh, way more people in California. They're more liberal. They're more crazy. You think they would party afterward. Well, no. When the, par- the bars go to two o'clock and just that one extra hour kept people at the bars and got them a little more wasted where they were, everyone was good. They had no more energy, I guess, to go to the next level and or too vast and too spread out or like people come from so far. There's no after party. There's no after party. Mm. So there's no, the scene was different. It was more concentrated on the after party and making friends with the fans in every city so that naturally that's how we gain our fan base. You can't do that in California, party with your fans afterward. They all get kicked out because the bounce is like, get out. <laughs> it's different, you know. So yeah, and then the scene, well, the scene forever has changed now, but uh, I don't know, the, the whole life, the scene's a struggle. I mean, it's it's a difficult, it's difficult to make money, but it's it's a reward. So from all of the places that you've been, where would you say has been the most fun to play? Has the best fans? Like, you enjoy going back there to play, you know, all the time. Oh, God. I hate to hurt some feelings, but let's just say in general, we would make our money in this triangle from Seattle to San Diego. Seattle, San Diego to Denver. There's a triangle. And... All the Rocky Mountain states are perfect to make money in during the winter because every day, ski day, nobody really works. Everyone treats a Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday like a Friday, Saturday, and they're rich, so they party. So we would just hang out in the Rockies every day performing in a different mountain town three hours away. So right away, any state with the Rocky Mountains in it, <laughs> Idaho, Utah, portions of Utah, um, Colorado, Colorado, and Colorado, and one more time, Colorado, <laughs> and <laughs> and then Arizona. We love we have a we have a love for Arizona because we worked all three markets: Flagstaff, Prescott, Phoenix, and Tucson. We worked all four of those markets for twenty years, and then Arizona, and then California. We worked all the California markets for twenty years, and then we got love for Portland and Seattle and Boise, Idaho. Great Northwest, but it's too remote, too far, and too few people. So we took that out of our route. We took New York City and driving all the Midwest, we, the South. We're over it. And then Hawaii is fantastic. Hawaii is wonderful. You, we used to make money before 9/11. We tour there twice a year, make money. But after 9/11, they started charging for baggage. Yeah, yeah. We've talked to a few bands that um, are in Canada. And, you know, or from like, you know, New York and you can pass into Canada. So on both sides that have said, if you're going to effectively do a show in like bounce back and forth between the two, then you have to make sure that you have a whole band ready to borrow you gear. So you don't have to go through customs and deal with all of that bullshit. It's a, it's a joke. They shook me down. I think I could I could speak on it for hours, but yeah, they shook me down in two ways. They took a lot of money from me on the Canadians at the border in um, British Columbia, Vancouver. I have no love. And, I, and my whole life, I was wondering why people talk smack on the Canadians, and I was like, oh, they're very nice people, but no, they talk they talk shit about us continuously. I was watching TV up there every time I go up there. I check on. And the ones that come here, you know, they think they're better. And um, I didn't, you know, it took me years to get to, to realize this. I live, I live in the amongst Canadians, and I guess I'm grateful for the money they put into the economy. But yeah, we have about 100,000 Canadians that come here every year and add to our population. But um, they're fine, they're fine people. But 
they hate I'm aware that they don't feel the same about us. Hi, <laughs> track. Sorry. Negativity. Um, so, so we'll get back to positive stuff, though. You have... Yeah, they shook me down. Their government shook me down hard. Like, nearly a thousand dollars. I'll never play there. Wow. That's... I'm over it. I mean, we did. We had some decent tours, but when they... When they hand you three hundred dollars, you're like, okay, thanks. And then you realize three hundred dollars is one hundred seventy-five dollars. You're like, why leave the richest country on earth? And we don't have borders. We just drive from Tucson all day to Ohio, to Warsaw, Wisconsin. We, you know, play Detroit. You name it. We're up in there, Minneapolis. We go wherever we want without having a border check. As long as we do the speed limit, we're fine. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I still, I still have love for America. Um, so, with you know, t do you tour now anywhere outside of your your triangle? Well, here, here's to put a point on my point. When I we, we get the band together for ten days every uh, every other year, and we tour Colorado. We go. We st day one is Flagstaff, Arizona. Day two is Durango. And then every Rocky Mountain ski town, Breckenridge, uh, you no know, summit, no, that's California, um, Denver, Pueblo, or Collins, you name it, the front range to the, all the Rocky Mountain towns, Crested Butte, you name it. So Aspen Vale, Snow Park, Winter Park, excuse me. And then, um, so it's, but we don't do it in the winter anymore. We made the fans 20 years ago there. Now we do it in the summer. And we come there for 10 days and play every day on. We have a blast. And we'll see each other every two years. And we have a 30 year anniversary tour coming up. It's supposed to come up next year on two, 2021. But I'm realistic and I'm married to a physician. So truth is, let's get our style of show business is dead for the next two to three, maybe more years. And I hate to be a pessimist, but I'm a realist and I'm actually an optimist. So that's the stinger, but no longer can we play indoors and make the little bit of money that we were able to scrape every night. Sad but true. So what do you think the solution to that would be? Outdoor show? Well, I know. Well, yes, that's the logical. And then when people do get let back indoors, say three years from now, no longer are people like me going to be encouraged to have a, a band with a girl on violin, a dude on piano, a cat on um, banjo, another one over here on congas. It's that the whole community love jam is over. It's now I'm practicing piano, like <laughs> polka songs on piano so I can play the whole polka book. No. I'm trying to be able to play the whole polka book instead of having the whole eight people to do it on a horn and instruments, rhythm instruments. Now I'm able to do it with a, you know, stride piano on my left hand and the chord melody on my right hand and I can sing. So now I've got all the parts covered. So what I'm doing is I'm always been good at predicting what's going to happen next, but I'm able to now, I foresee that if you love music, like I love music, these band leader, song leader types are going to have to master their instrument. And the day I didn't take my guitar serious, I, I was just happy to have someone play guitar really well and I'll jump around and sing my song. But it's not, you're not going to, we can't rely on others anymore as we used to. We can't, even if, though we want to, we need that energy to bounce it off. We physically can't make money and do that. The first people that are going to be able to play indoors are solo pianists, and solo acoustic guitarists. Mm. So, if you want, if you want to get into it in three years, I suggest practice your guitar and singing, and practice your piano and singing. So I've noticed you've done a few live things where you went live and people could Vimo uh, and pay you. Do you feel yes. like, like that is what the focus should be right now as we're in this? Yes, year? I and then I told my brother he needs to do it. Because I, I, every time I do it, people put tip jar in my then or my PayPal, and I, I, I can't believe it. It's like an honor. And um, I called my brother. I said, "Hey, you know, little buddy, you need to 
do the same. People want to hear you. It's not just about me. And it takes, I guess, some courage. And he's like, ah, oh, man, that, that's your thing. And so, you know, I'm like, come on, dude, get paid. I mean, it's, but it's not about the money either. It's when you get the tip, it's like, wow, I'm, it validates doing this. You know, why am I, at first I'm thinking, wow, I'm seeing in the garden from my own ego to see what my friends think about me. But then when people write me private messages to thank me sincerely for getting them out of their gloom or looking at things in a different way or hearing an old song that brought a tear to their eye, it really, it, it makes you feel good. And, and then if it's attached to PayPal and you're writing songs and singing them in tune, why not? Yes. I used to make money in the bars doing that every night. Now I make money in my garden like every six weeks. And that's another thing. You have to m go into the bars is a thing I had to do. So when I go into the garden, that's why I don't do it all the time because I do it when I want to. And on the good nights, I could pull it off. I could sing in tune and tell some stories and have fun doing it. <laughs> do you have a schedule? Like, ha have you kind of moved to, I'm going to do no. this? No. <laughs> and people ask me, Chris, announce it because other artists are doing that. I'm like, if I were to put a date on it, it would give me too much anxiety <laughs> and I would enjoy it. So I have to do, I just have to feel it. And plus another thing, I don't want my kids or my wife coming out chastising me, which they have. <laughs> if I'm singing a full volume in the garden, and someone's kicking a soccer ball and laughing at me. <laughs> you know, I'm insecure too, like everybody else. Hmm. I don't know. You don't portray that. <laughs> well, it's like, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I don't want to say master, but I'm a, living my whole life on stage. So if I'm sick or have the flu, you wouldn't know it. I mean, the bandmates don't know when I'm sick. Wow. I'm up there faking it. I've got a broken leg. I, you know, you just fake the show must go on. You do not cancel the gig. If you cancel a gig, you will never work there again. Yeah. Count that one off your list. So where, like, where's been the best venue to play? Okay, Berkeley, a place called Ashkenaz. Ashkenaz African Cultural Center. I know it's kind of an oxymoron because Ashkenaz is a type of Jewish person. European Jew and African Culture Center in Africa, but it's both. A dude, I wish I knew his name, but he was a civil rights leader in the East Bay during the 60s. And he was able to save all the protest signs, the civil rights era and pro the Vietnam protest war signs from the 70s. And he got the money aside and it's a little Jewish guy. And he put together the Ashkenaz Cultural Center. And later, I think the name was that of later, perhaps, uh, African Cultural Center. Mm. And he would book international world um, music, the kind of music I love, like um, West African guitar music and Senegalese music and uh, reggae bands. Ska band, and only white bands that really played there were ska bands. So we were honored. That's why I met a lot of famous cats there. Um, Tipa Irie and um, Buju and different Ooh. reggae dancehall artists backstage because it's they, it was one of the first places. Most places in the day would let you smoke weed backstage, but it was just a big open party with like four or five bands, international, black and white, unity, Arabic band here and there. Hispanic bands there. It was just a wonderful, wonderful place. And then one day the owner got assassinated by a, a dude. And uh, the people kept, Berkeley people kept the cultural center going in his honor and his name. It's called Ashkenaz African Cultural Center. And it's the greatest venue, the most beautiful vibe you'll have in your life where like black and white people dancing next to one another with a, uh, Arabic person or an East Indian in their garb, like doing a belly dance or whatever next to like some white kids, some college kids from down the way or some San Francisco hipster rich kids over here. Or, but it just, without, it's an inclusive scene and everyone's enjoying cultural music. Oh, to, to tie it all in, the gentleman that was assassinated who started it, whose idea is, it is, he, the, he collected the signs from the protest era 
and they're on the back wall of the club behind the bandstand when you're watching the band all the signs like you know women's rights this and that those signs from the 60s are the backdrop of this club and it's a hall from like the 30s or 40s oh it's such a neat place that and then hawaii the hawaii hut was great we had a lot of fun shows in hawaii uh petaluma had a neat place up in california uh, the greatest place we ever played was Red Rocks. My brother and I recently played Red Rocks. We, we sat in with Judge Ruffnet from Denver. They hosted us, Paul and Brothers, one of our biggest feathers in our cap. And that just happened like two Augusts ago. Neat. Yeah. Yeah. And then what else were fun ones? Uh, uh, we had so many fun shows in Colorado, pretty much anywhere in Colorado. Durango, Fail. Aspen. We've always had great times in Colorado. Great. So San Francisco too. Frisco, yeah. So so Chris, in closing, uh, yeah. to, pimp your shit. Uh, where can people find your stuff and um, you know merch and things that people can purchase? Where are they? What you what you hacking? What can people acquire after this evening show? Uh, the easiest way, I'd say Google it, just put it in your computer, and Warsaw Merge, or it's California Celts Merge, and um, you could do it, and it, it's kind of embarrassing, but um, my I activate all those websites on Facebook, so you can message me, I'll get the messages, I do mail order through Facebook all the time, like I said earlier, I book my tour through Facebook, so I do my sales through Facebook as well, but CD Baby, they could sell you our discs and vinyl as well and they can stream it you can buy a download it were available on all streaming uh, capacities I, need to stop I may use that word <laughs> <laughs> yeah and so yeah just look for it or contact me direct I'll gladly make you a package and throw some stickers and there's some goodies some guitar picks you name it thanks for supporting us <laughs> you know what I think Scout Band should start having as a merch item because People have guitar picks, which is great, right? But what about yeah. the instruments that make the main sound that is ska? Ha valve oil. Here's, I'm patenting this idea. People need to start fucking putting into their merch packages valve oil. We need more horn players, goddammit, so. <laughs> yeah, like a little kit for the horn players, absolutely. Right? Wouldn't that be something neat? You could, like, wrap a little sticker around it that's your band stuff and be like, I got valve oil from I, this band. I did that with the tin whistles. Oh. I, put, I printed out some Warsaw tin whistles, and I did some California Celts, too. would put a nice vinyl sticker on a whistle that I'd buy in bulk, but the quality went down and the price went up, so I can't do that anymore. Ah. Uh, but, yeah, we do... We, all those weird ideas are fun. Yeah. What What do you think is your most unique piece of merchandise? Well, we have our current one is pretty cool because it, we've been selling shirts forever, but we do a pull. We have a polo, a double tip polo, like a root boy style polo with a well, different design. And um, and, and and hoodies. I think those are cooler than a t-shirts so hoodies and right now the cool thing is that I have the double tip polo shirts that are black and then the hoodies black hoodies and the LP those are my cool three items and then we love the big on compact discs we have totally nautical songs of the Spanish main by the California Celts that record is outstanding I don't mind saying for myself <laughs> <laughs> that's the fun stuff so I want to thank you. We've reached the top of the hour, so we're going to let you go so we can actually play your music in the second half. Yay. So, Chris, thank you very much for joining us this evening. And, uh, you know, I'm excited. I hope that you continue to, every six weeks, even though there's not an exact date, <laughs> sing in your right. garden and, and make music. And, and thank you so much for being on the show. You're very welcome. Thank you, Jeff, Scott Kidd, and Kiff. The engineer. And have a wonderful evening, sir. You as well. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. That was Chris Poland from Warsaw Poland Bros and California Celts. And we're going to take a short break, after which we will return to play music, the most fun part of the evening, Always right? Is. Yes. So for those of you watching, paying attention, 
Uh, give us a few seconds and we'll be back with music so that you can dance in your house too, okay? Thanks. Bye.